Welcome back to Horrifying Stories. In 1996, two fishermen were out early to cast their net and catch some fish. As they tried to pull the net back to the boat, it felt heavy. Thinking their net was filled with fishes, the two got excited and hurriedly pulled it up. But when their net surfaced out of the water, they were surprised to see their catch, a dead man's body. This is his horrifying story. Viewer discretion is advised. Husband and wife Albert Johnson Walker and Barbara Walker lived in Ontario, Canada with four children. Albert was not able to finish school, so it was rough for the family. He took one odd job after another until he had his break when he was hired as a bank teller for a trust company. Then he started to file other people's income taxes to earn extra money on the side. Eventually, he saved up enough money to quit his job as a bank teller and started his own bookkeeping business called Walker Financial Services Incorporated. He was good at what he did and grew the business after a decade. Albert and his wife lived a happy life with their children and even became a Sunday school teacher. Life seemed to be perfect. In 1990, Albert told his wife that he wanted to bring Sheena, one of their daughters, to a skiing trip in Europe for a father-daughter bonding. His wife agreed and after a few days, Albert and Sheena flew to Europe to start their supposedly fun vacation. Unbeknownst to his wife, Albert was living a double life. Albert went to Europe not to have a vacation or bond with his daughter and go on a skiing trip. Albert was trying to run away from the police. Flashback four years ago, apparently in 1986, Albert started to invest a large portion of his money in a stock deal, but unfortunately, the stock collapsed and lost all his money. He ended up defrauding his clients in the sum of 3.2 million Canadian dollars. He also defrauded his fellow churchmates and other friends millions of dollars. Before he left Canada, he remortgaged their house for over $44,000 without his wife knowing. He was charged with 32 counts of fraud, theft, and money laundering, becoming Canada's most wanted and being fourth on Interpol's list of international fugitives. Arriving in London, Albert changed his identity. He became known as David Wallace Davis, a wealthy American entrepreneur with a young wife, which was actually his daughter Sheena, and they had two children. After some time, Albert met a receptionist for a fine art auctioneer in North Yorkshire named Elaine Boyce. As they were having a chat, Elaine mentioned that she has a boyfriend who really wanted to move to Canada. Upon hearing this, Albert offered to help them. So, Elaine arranged a meet-up between David, as they know him, and Ronald Joseph Platt, Elaine's boyfriend. Ronald was a TV repairman who was raised in Canada but has been living in Europe for many years already. All Ron wanted was to go back to Canada. He was so crazy about Canada that he even had a tattoo of a maple leaf on the back of his right hand. Not long after their first meeting, David secured a deal with Ron to start a TV repair business using the money that he embezzled. He also offered them a share of his new company called Cavendish Corporation. He made them directors of the company and explained to them that he did not want his name to be affiliated with the company because he had an ex-wife who is chasing him for alimony. Gaining their trust, Elaine and Ron accepted David's convincing offer. Everything seemed to be going well. Elaine and Ron even traveled all over Europe to check out properties, but little did they know, all of these were just merely a facade. On Christmas of 1992, David invited Elaine and Ron for a Christmas dinner at home. Much to their surprise, David gave both of them an extravagant Christmas gift, a one-way ticket to Canada, Ron's ultimate dream. David told them they need to take the flight before the end of February or else the ticket will expire. It was very sudden for both of them, but David told them that he wanted Ron to leave his dream, and so, they decided to take it. Before flying to Canada, in order for Ron to remain as a director in their company, David had asked Ron to leave his rubber stamps to be used for his signatures, 
his birth certificate, driver's license, and a credit card. Unsuspecting, Ron obliged to everything that David had asked him. He really believed and trusted David. So in February 1993, Ron and Elaine flew to Canada and started a new life there. It was very tough for both of them to start everything from scratch, especially in the middle of winter. Ron had difficulty looking for a job. They could barely make ends meet. Soon after, their relationship started going downhill. As soon as Ron and Elaine left for Canada, Albert, who was also David, had already begun executing his evil plans in secret to steal the identity of Ronald Platt using Ron's birth certificate and driver's license. In no time, he was already living in Europe as Ronald Platt and everything went smoothly according to his plans. After five months of living in Canada, Elaine went back to Europe to attend her sister's wedding. Being a close family friend, David was also invited to the event. As David and Elaine were talking, he found out that Elaine and Ron had separated and Elaine would no longer go back to Canada. He talked to Elaine and tried persuading her to give Ron another chance and go back to Canada to patch things up with Ron. But Elaine's mind was already set. She did not want to go back to Canada nor did she want to save their relationship. And that was the last time Elaine talked to David. Several months had passed and the real Ron came to a realization that his Canadian dream was not really working out for him. He made a difficult decision to go back to Europe. He got back to Europe and decided to live close to David. Needless to say, this is a very big problem for David and Ron still had no idea that David was in fact living his identity. One day, David invited Ron to a fishing trip on his boat to unwind from a stressful move back to Europe. Ron thought it was a good idea as he had a very rough life in Canada and he certainly needed to relax. So both of them hopped on David's boat and went out in the open sea. Four miles out, as Ron was casting his fishing rod, David silently went behind Ron's back and hit Ron on the head with an anchor. Immediately, Ron lost consciousness and David then tied the heavy anchor around Ron's waist and dropped his body in the English Channel. David went home that day as if nothing had happened. Six weeks after David's murder of Ron, two fishermen got on their boat and went to the English Channel, just near the area of Devon, and started to cast their net. The first spot that they went to was not giving them any fish, so they decided to go on another six miles to an area where they don't usually go called the roughs. They decided to use a method called trawling, where they attach a cone-shaped net behind their boat and pull it to catch as many fish as there are in the area. When they got their net back on the boat, they were stunned by their discovery. Apparently, their net did not only catch fishes but also a dead man's body. The body was already badly decomposed and they could not find anything that could identify him. The only significant thing that he had was a Rolex timepiece and a faded tattoo on the back of his right hand. The man seemed to have drowned. He also had an injury at the back of his head. But authorities have thought that probably it was from the net of the fisherman that hit his head. Now, their only problem was the man's identity. Oddly, there were no missing persons reported in the area. However, one of the authorities noticed the man's Rolex watch. It was an expensive Rolex Oyster Perpetual wristwatch. The watch had a serial number that can be traced if the watch was serviced. So the authorities contacted the company and provided them with the serial number. Finally, they found out the owner of the Rolex watch. It belonged to Ronald Joseph Platt. The authorities then found out where the last known address of Ron was in Essex. They contacted his landlord and his landlord gave the police the number that Ron provided as a reference. It was David Davis. Apparently, David and his daughter, whom people knew to be his wife, had moved to Essex towards the end of 1994, almost two years after Ron moved to Canada. The police then contacted David and invited him to the station to provide more information about Ron. David was very cooperative. He even brought a picture of Ron and told the police that he lent Ron money to start a new business in France. And so, he thought that Ron was in France. They let David go when they had all the information that he provided. The authorities were about to close the case as an accident, but they had a missing information. So the investigator called David again on the phone, but he was not answering or returning his call. 
the investigator then asked Peter Redman, a colleague of his in Essex, to visit David's house, the Little London Farmhouse, and ask him the information that he needed. Peter traveled to a rural village that he was not familiar with. The houses did not have any names or numbers, so he knocked on the first door. An old gentleman answered the door, and Peter asked him if that was the Little London Farmhouse. The man then said that the house that he was looking for was the next house, which was owned by Ronald Platt. Instinctively, Peter got suspicious and asked more questions about this Ronald Platt that the man was talking about. And interestingly, the neighbor also mentioned to Peter that Ron had a boat. Peter then reported all that he found out to the Devon Police Department, who was in charge of the case. The authorities went back to the fisherman who found Ron's body and they mentioned that they also found an anchor in their net along with the body, but did not think anything about it at that time. The authorities were able to retrieve the anchor and kept it at that time, not really knowing its significance. The Devon police were also able to talk to Ron's brother, and he gave them information that Ron had a relationship with Elaine Boyce. The authorities were able to contact Elaine, and she was able to give them information on Ron and David's connection. She also recalled that David called her weeks prior but did not mention about Ron's death. She found it very suspicious and thought that David had to do something with Ron's death. After a few days, David contacted Elaine and asked her if she could meet him. She was afraid as she was certain he killed Ron, but she did not want him to know about her suspicion so she played along with him. After they had met for coffee, Elaine contacted the police and informed them that David was on his way home and was riding a train. Authorities made a decision to arrest David and to interrogate him as a murder suspect. When they arrested David, he was compliant and cooperative to the officers. When they got to the station, the police took his wallet and found two identification cards. They were surprised that he had two IDs. One was named David Davis and the other was Ronald Platt. They also got his fingerprint and run his prints on the Interpol's database. And it was there that they found out that he was after all Albert Johnson Walker and was on Canada's most wanted list. The authorities were also able to trace the boat that Albert Walker used when he did the crime. In the boat, they found a lot of evidence such as Ron's fingerprints, hair, and blood. The anchor that the authorities were able to recover also matched the shape of the wound on Ron's head. The authorities were then able to find out the date of death using the Rolex watch. The watch stopped working after two to three days of inactivity while it was underwater. Albert Johnson Walker pleaded not guilty in his murder trial, but with all the evidence presented, he was convicted to life sentence in the murder of Ronald Platt. In 2005, Albert Walker was transferred back to Canada where he faced additional charges of fraud, theft, and money laundering. He is currently serving his life sentence at Kingston Penitentiary. Albert's daughter, Sheena, was allowed to go back to Canada with her two children. To this day, the father of the two children was never revealed. Thank you for making it this far. If you'd like to hear more horrifying stories, please don't forget to click the subscribe button to keep you updated on our weekly uploads. We truly appreciate your support. Once again, thank you and we'll see you on the next one.